Hello everyone, it is August the 12th, Wednesday, August the 12th. I hope you had a good week. Um, here we are talking about Hebrews again. And uh, last week we began talking about the faith chapter of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Sometimes um, these little monikers we put on biblical things are sort of stretched and inappropriate sometimes even, um, but not, not so here. Uh, I think it's appropriate to talk about Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter of the Bible. I want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, today we're going to look at these characters, specifically these characters mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, but a couple of things to remind you of. Uh, we really tried to emphasize the idea that their faithfulness, all these characters that we're going to talk about, their faithfulness was prompted and based on God's faithfulness. And the, the text really features that idea. God is faithful. God was faithful to them. He's faithful to us. And so our faithfulness to him is based on his faithfulness to us. And he is always faithful. I always appreciated uh, uh, Paul's expression in Romans. Um, God swore by himself because it is impossible for God to lie. And so God is faithful. Also notice that uh, the faith chapter really begin, begins at the end of uh, Hebrews 10. And of course, the idea of faith isn't just introduced here. In a sense, it's the underlying foundation for the book of Hebrews. He's writing to them about the comparison of old and new things with the underlying message of the new Christ is better, so stay faithful. Um, we talked about that in chapter 4. Don't shrink back. Don't fail to enter your rest. So let's read uh, really briefly the introduction to the, the words before he starts talking about specific individuals. And then we'll just quickly go over the hallmarks of faith and then look at these individuals. 1036. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet, in a, for yet a little while, the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. For we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that, we're, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We talked about that last week. Um, faithfulness, the hallmarks of faithfulness. First of all, it doesn't shrink back. And again, a, a, an important feature of faith, maybe, maybe the main feature of faith in Hebrews. He does not want these Hebrew Jewish people to shrink back, to go back. In fact, again, thinking back about chapter 4, going back to, oh, why did, why did you bring us out here in the wilderness to die? We would have been better off back in Egypt, even though things weren't great. At least we would have been alive back there. Well, these people that the Hebrew writer is talking to would go back to Judaism. And the Hebrew writer is saying, why would you want to do that? Knowing what and who Jesus is and what he did for you. Don't shrink back. Faith doesn't shrink back. It is found in righteous people. Those who want to be, when we talk about righteous people, there's two senses we talk about righteousness as a condition or state of being and as a behavior and attitude. Those are the two different ways. Um, and it's both, but those who are righteous, those who are right before God, thinking of it as a state of being. If you want to be found righteous, you need to be a person of faith. You need to trust God. It gives us confidence and assurance of hope. Another great feature of the Hebrew writer, the Hebrew writer probably emphasizes this part of faith more than any other writer of the New Testament or any other book of the New Testament, because this writer might be a writer that wrote other things in the New Testament. But he really, uh, in this book, it's really featured, and it's understandable why. This system, rather than the old system, Christ, his covenant, his priesthood, his forgiveness, this gives us confidence. The old did not. The new does. 
And the feature of this is that it gives us confidence to, first, confidence that God will keep his promises, uh, but secondly, confidence to approach the throne of grace. It allows us to see the invisible and put our lives into focus, and that's going to be a great feature we'll talk about when we talk about these characters, especially the idea of see the invisible. It makes us attempt things which we cannot control, in which we cannot control the outcome, which is very similar to the idea of uh, seeing the invisible. Um, we, all of us as human beings, want to control things, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. When God talks about self-control, we need to control ourselves, and uh, God expects us to control our environment to some degree, but, but we also need to trust in Him and understand that our eternal destiny and the direction of our lives needs to be controlled by Him. And again, a huge feature of this text, as we'll look at, it makes us do unreasonable things. Again, see the invisible, go do things that we can't control the outcome. Those would be unreasonable to people. It, it transcends and determines, determines physical considerations. So again, this goes to the idea of controlling the outcome. Uh, it, it transcends, eh, I don't wanna overspeak it because we're gonna speak about it if we look at the individual. It makes us do what God says. Plain and simply. So all the things leading up to this point, not being able to control the outcome, do what other, it makes us do things that other people might consider ridiculous. That's all the same way of saying we do what God says, even if we don't understand it, even if others don't understand it, because we know that God's ways are right. We trust in that. We have confidence in that. It allows us to stand alone if necessary. It makes us pleasing to God, similar to the uh, first or second point. It, it's the first point, that faith is found in righteous people, people that are right with God, people that are pleasing to God. The word the ESV uses in verse 2, for by it the people of old received their commendation, approved, approval, commendation. God is pleased with us when we trust and obey. It makes the world unworthy of us. Um, okay, let's look at our characters. First of all, Abel offered a better sacrifice. Verse 4, by faith Abel, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Abel offered a better sacrifice through which he obtained a better testimony that he was righteous. Though he is dead, his faith speaks to us. And he starts off with this idea of though he's dead, his faith speaks to us. And I think the implication is that's going to be true of all these characters, isn't it? They're all dead. But their lives, their, their trust, their action, action speaks louder than Actions speak louder than words. Faith speaks louder than words. They still speak to us. Though he said, uh, his faith speaks to us. It's an interesting contrast that God said to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Abel's faith speaks to us of his faithfulness. His blood speaks to God of his brother's unfaithfulness. Um, we always try to the, the text, as you know, if you if you studied this story in Genesis, does not specifically say exactly exactly what they the, the, the instructions are not there for what they were to give. But one thing's for sure. It says here specifically, God commending him by accepting his gifts, um, and through his faith. Lord died, he still speaks. God accepted his gifts. I mean, we know enough about God to know. Uh, there's two parts to gifts, isn't there? There's the thing itself, doing the thing itself, but there's also the attitude by which we give. Yeah? God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give grudgingly to the Lord. And so we don't know for sure what it was about Abel that was... Uh, 
made it a better sacrifice. So I think we should assume it was both. He gave the right thing. What was the right thing? We assume it was God had an idea and he told him what to give and Abel gave what God said to give and Cain did not. But also perhaps and probably or probably his attitude was important in that as well. But whatever it was, it was a gift that was pleasing to God. Based on most of these examples, I think it, we should assume that he gave what God wanted and the way he knew that was God told him and he gave what he wanted. But again, the idea that the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, this, this idea of speaking. Uh, so he has two things of speaking. Abel speaks to us and Cain speaks to God. Abel speaks to us of faithfulness. Cain speaks to us, spoke to God, but also to us of unfaithfulness. The testimony of Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken up, verse 5, so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Zero details about all of Enoch's faithfulness. Um, but the, the, the recurring feature is this commendation and being pleasing. We're going to really harp on that. Faith is about making God happy, about pleasing Him, doing what He wants. Number three, Noah. Okay. Verse. Seven. By faith, Noah. Oh, actually, I missed an important. I'm sorry. I missed an important feature of number two, uh, and that's verse six. Uh, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. Forever, for who, for whoever would draw near to God. Remember, that's a feature of this letter. The idea of drawing near to God. If you want to approach God, you've got to believe that He exists. Verse six, and that He rewards those who seek Him. So first, believing that he exists and you have faith in his promises. Again, another feature. All of these people, God said to them, I will do this for you. And they believed that so much. They believed that God would keep his word so much. They did outrageous, as the world would see it, things. And so Enoch was like that as well. Okay, Noah, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world, and he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. We don't have a running commentary of that time period when Noah built the ark. But it says here that by reverent fear, reading on the PowerPoint. Noah believed that there would be a flood when it had probably never rained. The testimony of Noah's faith is, is the condemnation. His commendation is the condemnation of the world or those who mocked his faithfulness and their unfaithfulness. Notice what else faith produced in Noah. Noah fear or reverence. Um, actually, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. Did his faith produce fear and reverence, or did his fear and reverence produce faith? Uh, I don't know that that's answerable, because I think this, this, the two things are sort of hand in glove. They go together. Um, but going back to what I said earlier, we don't have a running commentary of his attitude. Not like, you, like most of you, I've thought a lot about Noah. I just sort of laid in bed at night and wondered about God said build an ark and hadn't even, probably hadn't even rained yet and we won't talk about all that, but um, a bizarre thing to do, a very bizarre thing to do. And uh, if we understand the geography correct, he was building an ark where there was not any water even to put it in. Just stupid, 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 a stupid, stupid, stupid thing to do if you're looking at him. And that crazy guy and his family uh, and I've wondered, 
through the years because you're not going to build an ark in, in six days, you know, in a week. I wondered through the years if Noah and the kids, especially the kids, Noah and the kids ever got to a point where they just, God, what are we doing here? Why am I building this ark? The text really emphasizes that, that he was faithful and he obeyed God in all that he did. And I, so I think it's important what, so why why does it talk about Noah's fear and reverence? It's only one of these characters that it talks about. In my mind, the most atrocious behavior, with that atrocious in quotes, is in, in this section, is Noah. He had the most atrocious, according to the world, behavior. And so I think that's why God really and the writer really emphasizes here his fear or reverence. The deeper, the deeper our fear and reverence for God, fear or reverence for God, the deeper it is, uh, the more we're willing to get out there or, or, or sort of put ourselves out there for the Lord. The more we both believe it intellectually, who he is, his existence, and notice, again, the two features, that he really, really, really does exist. And, and of course, we don't see him, so, but we believe he, he we trust that he's, he exists, but that the things that, that he says will come true, whether it, and, and need to be followed, whether it's his commands or his promises, that those things are inviolable. And so it produces in us a reverent fear um, and it pushes us to do things that are not easy. Uh, and as, as much as anybody in this text, no one did that. Abraham is often depicted. Oh, what well, else? We were reading the text first. Okay, verse 8. Well, it's a long one about Abraham, but well, it sort of comes and goes. Well, um, and there's one in the middle. So I think we'll read, we'll read down through verse 19. Eight, verse eight through verse 19. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, but in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, for said with him of the same promise. He was looking forward to, that, to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. By faith, no, let's skip that one. Uh, okay, down to verse 17. By faith, Abraham, actually, I guess I have these in order. So, first of all, Abraham's Abraham is often depicted as the human prototype of faith. He is considered the father of the faithful. We'll read Galatians 6, 3, 6 through 9 in a second. God's great plan to save man began with Abraham based on his faith. What we have today in Christ is a completion of the provisions of the covenant God made with Abraham based on his faith. All the nations have been blessed through him. I want you to notice something that's really stark about this. The characters in this section are not from the nation of Israel, for the most part. There are some, actually, some mentioned later. But the main features of this section are faithful people outside the Old Covenant. The main features. That's, I think that's significant. Because there were a lot of faithful people, Jeremiah, and there were a lot of faithful people in the old, under the Old Covenant. But the writer is trying to get across the idea that faithfulness is not just tied to the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant. It's a transcendent concept that all people, no matter where they are, uh, when they lived, that it applies to all people, faith in God, and he even features uh, people that would be considered really, really outsiders, but they had faith in God. And so Abraham 
was is the prototype of faith. We we'll talked a long time about that, I guess, but here's what um, I got the verse references wrong up there. It's three six Galatians three six through nine. As he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Well, that phrase is very important, counted to him as righteousness. What have we been talking about? This person was pleasing to God. He was commended before God. He was, he was found to be righteous. God was pleased with him. What was it about Abraham that, that pleased God? He believed God. And usually at this point, everybody just almost, a lot of people just fall over themselves to say, but he had to obey, and that's true. But that is not what the writer is trying to emphasize in Galatians, and it is what's being emphasized in Hebrews. But the main emphasis in Hebrews is the idea that he trusted God. Now, it's true that you can't separate out, because if you really trust God, you will, you will act. You can't separate out obedience. But it says here that he believed God. God sees into the heart. He, he can see if you're just faking it. He understands what kind of faith you have because he understands what's in your heart. And, and Abraham's faith, and he wasn't perfect. There are a few occasions recorded where he obviously didn't trust God in, in a specific occasion. But as far as his life was concerned, and as far as his relationship with the Lord, he trusted God. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And then, to all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So this is as a, in, in the Hebrew writer, this is as opposed to talking about people who had a relationship with God based on heritage. We talked about this earlier. What did you have to do to be a Jew? Nothing. You just had to be born to you. Uh, your parents had to conceive and give birth to you, and, and they circumcised you of the eighth day, and you were a Jew. Not so. What makes you pleasing to God in the new covenant and puts you in the new covenant begins with faith not with a physical birth. Um, we talked about the, the reference to Jeremiah 31, 31. I'll write my laws in their in, in new covenant in which I will write my laws in their hearts. Um, so they were people, we have to be people of faith. And Abraham was a person of faith. It's natural that most of what the writer gives Abraham, uh, the, the, the writer gives Abraham more attention to others. When he was called, he went. He lived as an alien. He looked, and I have a reference there to 1 Peter 1, 1 through 3. Peter says, we are strangers and aliens. And God said, get out of your country, for, go away from your people, from your cloistered environment, surrounded by family members that trust God also. Go down to this godless pagan place where you don't own anything, and you don't know, probably didn't know anybody, and didn't know the terrain, Go down there and live as an alien. I am taking you out of here to begin something that is going to be out of your control. Um, but of course, what it says, he was looking for a city whose builder is God, not some city that somebody in the, the Palestine or the Canaan land had built, but rather a city whose builder is God. And what a beautiful sort of metaphor and illusion um, it was a city, and it's very appropriate because throughout Hebrews, he's talked about the shadow and the real thing. The shadow being the thing on earth and the real thing being the thing in heaven. That was it for Abraham. The shadow was wherever he, the, the plains of Mamre where he lived or wherever he lived uh, on this earth. But the real thing for him was the city whose builder was God, whose foundation was laid by God. And that's the way it is and should be for us. He offered up Isaac, his only begotten son. Uh, this sounds like 1, 1, 1, 5, 
5, 5. He didn't just suppose God could raise Isaac from the dead. He was sure. And I mentioned before that it does not say that in the original text where the story is recorded. Well, in fact, here it is. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took, uh, took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. By the way, we're missing the tone of voice and the body language of Isaac here. Uh, wow. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Ah. Mm. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went, so they went both of them together. And when they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in, in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. So again, we're not given all this, you know, this says Abraham laid him on there and was Isaac squirming? Ah, uh, 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 was Abraham squirming? I kind of get the impression not. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, uh, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So we talked about how the emphasis is on trust, but just, but it is true that it's also on, uh, very much on, also, behavior. How did God know? Because he was willing to act. A Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. And then he ended up calling the name of the place uh, Moriah, which means the Lord provides. Um, but it, uh, earlier in the text, it talked about how uh, Abraham said he believed that God would be able, even if he had, had stabbed Isaac, and that he believed that God would raise him from the dead. That is faith. That's the strongest probably the strongest expression. We talked earlier about, and maybe I misspoke. Well, in a, in a way I didn't, but uh, we see earlier about how Moses maybe had the greatest leap. Well, he did in a certain way, or rather Noah in building the ark. In a, maybe, not maybe, in a more profound way, didn't Abraham have a greater leap than to take that knife in his hand? But he believed, he believed. And of course, uh, a clear uh, comparison to God himself, being willing to give his own son. The progenitor of, the earthly progenitor of faith, Abraham, was willing to do what God actually did. Uh, but, uh, by faith, Sarah, when she, she was beyond the proper time of life, knew God would provide a child. This is interesting. Uh, I'm going too long, so I won't read it. But, you know, she laughed at first, which is very interesting. And you can see in the text. And uh, <laughs> then the angel said she laughed. She said, no, I didn't laugh. Um, uh, yeah, you did laugh. Uh, it was a pretty interesting text. So she laughed. You know, here I am, a 90-year-old woman. What on earth? Um, but the text says by faith. So she did have faith. So it's interesting to me that the, so at a, I guess what I'm saying about that is at a certain point, even though she laughed, she must have trusted God because the text says so. So I think it's interesting that we're not given, we're told in the text the part where she laughed, laughed but uh, she must have trusted God uh, in the end to do it because the text says that she trusted God to be able to give her a son. Uh, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau regarding things to come. Uh, Genesis 27. This is not about the deception that took place during the blessing. It is that Isaac blessed the boy. So it's two separate things. And, and uh, actually, let's look at the text. So in 27 is where the deception took place. And then, and, and, you know, that he blessed both sons. And you remember what happened? Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob, the heel grabber came in and dressed up and, and made the, the stew that his 
brother would make and dressed up like him and smelled of the field. And, and Isaac says specifically, you deceived me. And so he got the blessing. And then uh, Esau came in and was just angry is probably an understatement, devastated. Although he should have seen it coming based on his, well, as the text said, his disregard for his blessing. Um, I think it's interesting, too, that the text says that Isaac was trembling when he figured out that when he realized what had happened and that, that Esau came in and, and Jacob had fooled him. It says that Isaac trembled. When, uh, but and then in the next chapter, after all that's done and the two blessings are given, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite woman. He goes on to talk about uh, his how his behavior needs to be. So it's just an, this is an interesting example of somebody that got tricked but still trusted God uh, in the bigger way. And, you know, the, 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 I think the temptation for Jacob would, I mean, Isaac would be to be angry at God. And, and of course, angry at um, Rebecca and really everybody except Esau. Um, but he went with God. Even though it was ill-gotten in, in some sense, and it's a, it's a complex story, the point about Isaac's faith is he saw it, he saw the hand of God in it, and he went with it, so he trusted. So this, I, I think this, this second blessing sort of confirms the idea that he had bought in to what God wanted to happen um, in chapter 28. Uh, by faith, Jacob blessed each of the sons of Jacob, Jacob, uh, uh, Joseph. Again, Jacob or Israel. It's interesting. It kind of says it uses both um, names in, in the text in Genesis 48. Knew the blessing was right, though he could not see it through. Uh, uh, I have that text too. After this, Joseph was told, "Behold, your father is ill." So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel sum summoned his strength and sat up in bed, and Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a company of peoples, and will give, you, give this land to your offspring after you. <coughs> For an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to Egypt in the land of born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. So there's kind of the, the important part of the text. He took them on as his own. They were grandsons, of course. Um, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are mine. So that the two firstborn. Um, he, he alludes to the two firstborn. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. And as we know, they ended up with a piece of, the Levites didn't have an inheritance. And the Levites did not have a, a, a territory. And Joseph's territory was split in two, which made 12 territories. But, uh, but again, his faith was... He went outside the normal thing that was done and trusted God enough to do the abnormal thing. By faith, Joseph asked that his bones be brought out of Egypt. A third time, the point is uh, that a dead man must trust in God to accomplish what will happen. Now, we didn't, didn't emphasize this in the first two times, but uh, a lot of the, some, well, Jacob had to trust that the blessing he was giving would come true even though he was giving it, quote, to the wrong, not the firstborn brother, saying the same deal. And notice how two, two of these uh, faith things are, have to do with the blessing and the, the carrying on of the heritage. Uh, Jacob, uh, or Israel, with Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and then Joseph asked that his bones be brought down. So, and he trusted, he obviously, it seemed, seeing as he would be, just be a, literally a bag of bones, he wasn't going to make it happen, but he trusted that the Lord, and how many years later, 400 years later, would make that happen. 
back to the living, Moses' parents put their child at risk by putting him in the river? Or was it such a risk if they knew God would help? And so, by the way, we haven't been reading the text. You, you, you read it on your own. I kind of miscalculated how much material I have. But um, Moses chose to support a slave nation. We, we will read this one because it's another big one. By faith, Moses, verse 23, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By the way, very important sentence. They weren't afraid of the king's edict. They were going to do what they thought God would want no matter what the king of, of Egypt said. By faith, Moses, verse 24, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the, the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. The, the reproach of Christ, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, we won't have time to talk about that, but uh, by faith he was he left Egypt. And so thinking about what he did and, and we know the story about him, how he killed the Egyptian and he saw his people suffering and, and he had so much to lose so much to lose but this is another example this is an example of faith all of these people had things to lose <coughs> by the way that's part of it not just doing outrageous things but what they would lose if they chose to do what God wanted he had so much to lose and completely the fact that he would pick a side that was completely subservient and had no power he hooked himself up with his people who at that point had no power of course God raised him up um, by faith the Jews became spectacles as they marched around Jericho another great one looking like idiots and so a great feature of this is doing things we've talked about said several times that if the world looks at it and you can just imagine them troops in around flippity flop flippity flop walking around that wall of Jericho and although we know that they were they had already heard the reputation of God and we're going to see in the next one um, but still these people marching around ah, or maybe they were standing up there on the wall thinking is today going to be the day they attack? But they did something that was kind of militarily silly. But they trusted. And they trusted that God would make the victory happen. Um, by faith, Rahab welcomed the spies. Uh, the text. Um, she says, We know your reputation. Uh, that the people have melted away before you. Isn't that a great illusion? The land, uh, the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. Um, and so <clears throat> she, she picks. She, she uh, abandons a secure place in a, in a wall of people that were militarily stronger in a, in a stronger position militarily she hears the reputation of God and she picks a side and she picks God's side. She trusts that God is more powerful. Um, and so uh, she makes them make a promise. She makes a promise. They make a promise. And she is in this chapter so many, many years later. The writer finishes off with a flurry of faithful. He mentions their names. Uh, just as importantly, describes their faithfulness. <clears throat> All these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. A very big idea. Uh, this is, by the way, he's using this, this series of people as an example, but he, he's in a sense saying, if you want to honor them, be faithful yourselves, because God has provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. You dishonor them. You, you dishonor their faithfulness if you don't stay perfect. They were, they were faithful, looking to the future, 
not being able to control things, you want to go back to a system you know and are familiar with in Judaism and not trusting God that this, this new system that is superior is the right one that will lead you to eternal life. Don't dishonor the people that you... And these Hebrew people that were being written to, they knew these stories. They knew about all these people. And the writer is saying, you will dishonor them. You will dishonor them if you don't stay faithful yourself. They, were, they would have loved to have lived in the time that you live in when they would have known about Christ and had a more certain uh, confidence in the, in the big plan. They, they were faithful not knowing the big plan. You have before you the big plan as Christ has, has fulfilled it. So don't dishonor them. Stay faithful yourselves. <clears throat> and that's it. I'll see you next week. Uh, it's another great chapter, chapter 12. It's, I really like chapter 12. Read it ahead. Talk to you next week.